The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today we have episode 108. The short story at the end of the episode is from 25 Perfect Days plus five more. That is 30-day program. That's actually from five more perfect days, but we squeeze it in there. But I have a very special guest today, uh, Doc Mike Simpson. Uh, he has helped me a lot with uh, different books. We've been on each other's podcasts. He is the host of the podcast, The Mind of the Warrior. He has an upcoming book, uh, Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. Uh, he let me read that, and it was amazing. We're going to dive into that today. Uh, Doc, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on, brother. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that's cool. I, I just happened to look back at our podcast when we recorded that. That was in uh, 2015. Uh, I know. Right? <laughs> it doesn't. It sure doesn't seem like six years, does it? Yeah. Time flies. <laughs> um, you know what? Can you... Do me a favor and tell the audience about yourself, because honestly, if there was any one other person, if I could start everything over and just have my ideal life, like the kind of shit I would love to do, it's pretty much what you've done. Um, so <laughs> if you could go over that, I thought that'd be awesome. But you've checked blocks that I haven't checked too, brother. So let's let's not leave that out. So okay. uh, I, as you said, uh, I'm a physician. I'm an emergency medicine physician here in the great state of Texas. Uh, actually just stepped away from, uh, from practicing clinically. Um, I do some stuff on the side. I got a lot of side projects, of course. Uh, I have the Greybeard Performance uh, brand and I sell supplements as well as uh, BJJ Gies, Rash Guards and, and other stuff through, through my brand. It's, all, it's, it's a philosophy all about, you know, as you said, the title of my book is Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. So I'm all about helping guys like you and me kind of get in touch with that warrior athlete lifestyle if they've maybe stepped away from it. So that's what I'm concentrating on now. I had a previous life as a special forces operator and an army ranger, did that for a while before uh, I went to, uh, to medical school and did 32 years total in the military, ultimately retiring as a major, as a physician before going into private practice. But uh, like I say, not working clinically anymore. I work as a SWAT doc. Um, I'm still on the roster to work as a, as a mixed martial arts ringside, uh, cage side fight doc, although it's kind of dried up a little bit in central Texas. Obviously, with the pandemic, we didn't have any of that. Uh, and I work also as medical director for a, a company uh, out here out of Texas uh, selling pre-hospital supply stuff. Awesome. Um, one thing I asked you to do, you did me a great favor by reading over um, a little synopsis of my TBI book, because one of my fears is that I, you know, I'm perfectionist. I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything major out. Um, and so it just, I kind of gave you a checklist of the different things that I did talk about. And I wanted to get your opinion on, you know, if there was anything that I did leave out and then we could go into some of these things uh, that I did mention and why they are important, because I think there's a lot of crossover between our books. Um, you go into, you know, the exercise of sleep, all those things, um, mm -hmm. which I also cover. So what was your impression? Was there, did you see any big holes that I was missing? Anything that I maybe could have covered and didn't? No, I, I sure didn't. And, and not only is there a lot of crossover in our books, but I mean, there's a huge crossover um, in our audiences because a, a lot of the people that I'm going to be speaking to, you know, are, are guys, again, guys like me, guys like you, maybe, maybe they got in the ring or got in the cage at some point in their life, or they served in the military and they might be dealing with these, these issues of TBI CTE, PTSD. So uh, I thought you did a great job of covering it. You know, it's uh, just like with my book, I, I don't, I do think it's possible to go too in depth. And, you know, I, I've picked up books and in the first chapter decided, all right, this, th there's rabbit holes in this book. I, I just, this is not for me. And I just put it aside. And I think I'm one of those people that I'm kind of like, uh, so there's a great line in the movie Apollo 13, right? Where they're coming back and they're, they're coming in a little bit shallow. And he goes, do you think we should tell the crew? Was well, there anything they can do about it? No, then we shouldn't tell them about it. So I think there's a lot of information you don't need. So, you know, why dwell on a lot of information you don't need? Dwell on the stuff that you can manage, you know, that you can manage day-to-day -day life. I thought you did an excellent job of that. And you start right off when you, when you, when you run down uh, the, the clinical manifestations of CTE. I mean, it's, it's verbatim right out of what the Mayo Clinic says. I mean, so this stuff that has been vetted 
Um, I think something that's important for people to know, um, just so they know this going in, and 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 I, I noticed, and I know you know this. I know you deliberately left it out, and I and I think that was the right thing to do. But I'm just going to plug it real quick that CTE is still it's an autopsy diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But I think that's going to change very soon. I, I think that we're start we're we're getting to the point now where we know enough about it that I think I think in the very near future, like probably in the next year, that's going to change because we we have enough clinical market. I mean, if we can diagnose fibromyalgia, we should be able to diagnose CTE, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's really no reason why we can't. They 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 need to take that out. Do we have enough clinical manifestations? We know what the PET scans look like. We know what the MRIs look like. Um, we know what the cognitive testing looks like. So there's really no reason at this point, in my opinion. So I think that's probably the next, the next big breakthrough in CTE is it will get stamped. Okay. This is exactly how we're going to diagnose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great point. Um, one of my fears, well, and I've kind of, I've kind of gotten over it. I've, I've changed my perspective on it is like, man, what I've done to my brain, like I, I was able to see how much damage there actually was. I going into this, I didn't think I even had brain damage. Like uh, I, I was like, ah, I'm normal, I'm fine. You know, I think that's a lot of what what a lot of us think. You know, because it's our day to day. But it wasn't until I started doing the testing, I was like, oh man, I had to come to, you know, understanding like, yeah, I have brain damage, but I was also able to repair so much of it. And like, I'm in the best place mentally. But there's still that fear is like, well, am I still going to develop CT down the road, you know? Um, and so that's something I wasn't really able to answer with the book. But I was like, you know what? I've improved my life so much. So even if I only, even if I only had this for the next two years or three years, mm-hmm. like the amount of time I spent getting it, the amount of money I spent getting it, like for this type of happiness and health is priceless. So um, that's what I'm hoping to give people and to give them hope and to uh, just let them know, like, not only, and maybe you can't repair everything, maybe you can't prevent everything, but you could definitely improve your symptoms, your coping mechanisms. Um, and I think that's huge. Absolutely. You can definitely, I mean, there, there's always an avenue for a better quality of life. You know, it, 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 is it possible to completely reattain? Maybe not, but that's, uh, that shouldn't be the goal. I mean, the goal should be, you know, better, better than you're doing now. And you brought up, you brought up a great point in that, you know, that you didn't realize it was there. You know, it's, uh, so think of a toddler, a toddler doesn't realize, doesn't look at us and go, Oh my God, I can't do all the things they can do. I don't have the communication skills that they have. I don't have the fine motor skills that they have. Toddler thinks like, this is what life consists of, right? Cause it's from their own point of view. And it's the same, you know, it's not like uh, your hearing starts to go, you can kind of notice that, right? Your vision starts to go, you, you notice that. You can't bench press as much, you notice that. When you start to have cognitive changes, when you start to have behavioral changes, you're often the last person to notice that. So it, it's really important that, that people uh, are accepting of receiving, receiving a diagnosis <clears throat> And, uh, and, and undergoing, you know, the clinical evaluation and the, and the test involved in that instead of being in denial. And a lot of people are. Now, when did, when did traumatic brain injuries, um, come into play? Like, when did you notice it as far as the military? I had never even considered it. Uh, I should have, but it wasn't until I saw like the Joe Rogan episode with, uh, Dr. Mark Gordon and I think mm-hmm. Andrew mm-hmm. Mark. That was the first time I even associated like the repetitive gunfire, the the blast, and everything causing um, you know traumatic brain injuries. When did when did you first realize that that was causing issues for people in the military? You know, uh, pre global war on terror, I think we were in complete denial, and um, and and to be honest, I mean, I probably have at least a small degree of CTE. I was a recoilless rifle gunner. So imagine uh, a 90 millimeter recoilless rifle and it's going off right by your right ear and doing that multiple times. And I think when it, when it first kind of clicked in my head that, Hey, what we do has long-term repercussions. We, we change, we were changing over from the 90 millimeter recoilless rifle to what's called the Carl Gustav, which is a, 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 it's a, a German kind of version of the same, same, same principle. It's an anti-tank bunker buster, 
And when, when we went to get those, they said, uh, well, you can only fire it so many times a year because of brain damage. Oh, wow. And I see my connection might be slowing down a little bit here. Um, so I was like, well, if that's true for this, it's got to be true for what we were doing before. And we weren't really paying attention to it before. Um, but like I say, it really wasn't until the global war on terror with, uh, you know, people being in live files, fire scenarios for long periods of time, people being around a lot of explosions in the form of IEDs, you know, firing weapons. Because, of course, in training, you wear earplugs. It's very controlled. If you're, if you're firing something like an AT4 anti-tank weapon, uh, you're wearing your earplugs, you're wearing your eye protection, and you're only firing one, maybe two in a day. In a full-scale gunfight, you know, to, you know, the, like the invasion of Iraq, you know, guys were exposed to multiple firings of these weapons. They're not walking around with hearing protection in, right? Because this, this was before we were wearing Peltors all the time. So, you know, you don't want to, you got to be aware of your surroundings. You got to hear somebody shooting at you. Um, and that's when we started to see it. And that's one thing that I, I think the U.S. military doesn't get enough credit for is when there is a, when there is a war going on, we really are paying attention we do start paying a lot more attention medically. Um, and I think that's an outgrowth of having not done it in the past, not recognizing what the guys World War II, Korea, Vietnam went through, right? We didn't start really looking at Agent Orange until many, 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 you know, even decades later. And I think we've learned from that. So because of that, you know, we were still in the first decade of the war and CTE was on everybody's mind. And, and you know, everybody was really looking at this and the, and the evaluation process was really starting to look into this. So that's, that's, of course, when it came, became a little bit more of a hot button issue with me. And then about the same time, around the uh, 2012 to 2014 time frame, when I started to get a little bit more involved in mixed martial arts, was also the same time that the UFC stepped up and said, hey, we're going to start enrolling our fighters in these long-term studies. So I started looking at it kind of in both ways. And that's, and that's actually how you and I come, came to meet, because I wrote that, that blog article uh, you know, about fighters, you know, with TBI and, and kind of initially what they're going to go through. And uh, I think I'm pretty sure that's that's what brought you and I together initially. <laughs> yeah, I, I had forgotten all about that. Yeah, uh, that, that's crazy. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's when I thought I was totally good. Um, <laughs> now, with with TBIs and PTSD having so many similar, you know, symptoms and everything else. And like Dr. Mark Gordon says, you know, his understanding kind of is PTSD is just manifestation of TBIs. Totally. It seems yeah. as if that would be incredible for the military. Cause it's my impression is that most people that are in the military, whether vet or, or current um, do not want to say that they have PTSD. That's kind of like a sign of weakness. You know, they, they think mm -hmm. it's something like wrong with them uh, with the way that they're thinking or whatever else, or, or the big stigma with it. Whereas, a traumatic brain injury yeah you still can't see it but it's like then you kind of i don't know maybe it's a little bit more forgiveness for yourself it's like okay no that's something that happened to me it's not you know it's not something wrong with my brain like or it's a physical thing wrong with my brain so um i don't know for me that seems like that would be something that more military people would be more likely to accept help with than saying you know going to a doctor and saying well i've you know I can't handle the stress or, or whatever they think PTSD actually is. Yeah. No. And, and I think, I think that is the case. I think people are starting to become a lot more accepting uh, of it for just that reason. And you know, we know that, you know, there are cases of PTSD that are completely separate, obviously from CTE, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, people have PTSD from traumatic episodes in which, you know, they have no, no TB, never had a TBI, you know, CTE, but if you have CTE, the likelihood of you then having PTSD or PTSD-like symptoms increases exponentially, you know, exponentially. And, and like you said, that's, that's the symptom. You know, that's like, well, I have shoulder pain. Well, why? Is it, do you have a torn rotator cuff? Do you have an impingement? Do you have frozen shoulder? You know, uh, is, is it a supraspinatus tear? Why do you have shoulder pain? So we need to, you know, then diving into that, but then looking at it and going, oh, you just have shoulder pain you know, I, I tell people this, you know, if we just say that person is, is clicking all these boxes, well, that looks a lot like PTSD. So we're going to do psychological counseling and we're going to throw psychological medications at it. Well, that's like saying, I'm not going to do an x-ray. I'm not going to do an MRI. I'm not going to bother to try to see why your shoulder hurts. Well, obviously 
I might be able to mask things, but your shoulder is never going to get better, you know, and, and CTE might be that underlying problem. So we have to dive into that and say, well, maybe the CTE is now, fortunately, we know that a lot of things that can help with PTSD as a standalone diagnosis also help with CTE. All, a lot of the stuff that you're outlining in your book, you know, which is, which is basically, it, you know, for, if, if I had to sum it up in an elevator pitch, you know, embrace life and live healthy is basically what it, what it boils down to. Mm. Um, and if you do all those things, whether you have PTSD as a standalone diagnosis or PTSD as a secondary effect of CTE, you're going to have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, now let's, let's go into your book. Um, cause I'm sure lots of listeners, they may not have any, you know, anything going on with their brain, but they may be looking to improve themselves to get back. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things I struggled with was, you know, not being able to train jujitsu because of injuries or whatever, or just getting older and losing, you know, lower testosterone, all these other things. So, and before, before I forget, I do want to thank you for the book too, because man, when I read it, uh, the very next day I went out and I got six different doctor appointments because <laughs> in the way that you line that out, the way where you put that in the book, um, really making a point like, yeah, look, we're working on all these other things, but we're not seeing doctors to, you know, get our full body checked out. Yeah. And so I went and I got my colonoscopy. I got my feet checked. I got my glasses. I got, so, uh, yeah, thank you for that. That, that was good huge. for you, man. <laughs> yeah. And knowing how many other people that's going to, that it's going to trigger them to go do the same thing. So I, I think that that alone is a huge, uh, plus of your book. Um, so what would you tell someone, you know, the elevator pitch for your book, mm -hmm. like why, why is exercise important? Why, why, you know, why is sleep important? Why, what are some of the things that everyone should be doing, whether they're a man over 40 or, I mean, it seems like I think anyone would benefit from this advice. So what would you be telling people are some of the key things that they should be doing? Yeah. Uh, great, great question. I mean, it, it, it really, it's all summed up by uh, exercise healthy diet and, and sleep, you know, and there, and there's other things that fit into those categories and we can, we can add some overlap from, from other stuff that you can do in your life. But, and I, and in the, as you know, in the book, I, I start with sleep um, because I think it's really important. We know that, you know, uh, a huge number of Americans, huge number of the developed world don't get enough sleep. Um, and they basically walk around chronically uh, deficient on sleep. They're tired all the time. So they're looking for stimulants, which, you know, th then there's the backfire from that and everything else. So they're masking the problem. And the problem being that they're not getting enough sleep and sleep is vastly underrated in its importance. And you know, kudos to Jocko Willink, man, the guy goes to bed at 11, he gets up at 430. He can do that, you know, by from some genetic gifts that he has, he's able to do that. But for him, he's getting enough sleep. He's never tired. Most people aren't that way. You know, it's, you know, between seven and nine hours is kind of ideal. And I, I tell people plan on a nine to 10 hour block, you know, always block out more time than, than you actually need. And I'm one of those people that, you know, I have a period of wakefulness in the night where I'll, you know, I'll wake up and just kind of lay there for a half hour, 45 minutes or so. So that's a half hour, 45 minutes that I need tacked on to make sure that I get enough sleep and, you know, the benefits of sleep, uh, I mean, that's your recharge time, not only physically, you know, that's when you make your physical gains, but mentally, all the stuff you do during the day, all the stuff that kind of clutters your brain during the day and kind of gets to you at night, you go to sleep, the night crew comes on and they start looking at all these crumpled pieces of paper, all these, these notes that you've taken throughout the day. And they go, okay, all right, that's important. We're going to put that in permanent memory. Yeah, we don't need to, well, that we're going to burn. That's not important. We're going to get rid of that. So all your permanent memories start to get formed and the cleaning crew comes in too, because you've, you've made a mess of your brain during the day. You've made a complete mess of it. So the cleaning crew has to come on. And one of the things that builds up during the day, because you're, you're so active is what we call amyloid proteins. And you build up these beta amyloid proteins and at night those get flushed out. Well, guess what happens if you don't flush them out? Well, they stay around. Well, guess what we see in people with Alzheimer's and also in people with CTE we see amyloid, it stays around and it basically forms these little, it's almost like scar tissue in your brain. So it's, it's vitally important that you're getting rid of this stuff. So from a, from a mental standpoint, as well as physical standpoint, you know, there's a reason that you not only feel 
physically tired when you didn't get enough sleep. You know, like I, I just, I can't get going, but you also notice that your focus is off and all these other, you never got a chance to completely hit reset. You know, it's like, if you're doing, uh, if you're doing anaerobic intervals and I shorten your rest interval from 90 seconds to 45 seconds, that interval, that second interval now becomes harder, right? Now, now instead of my heart rate getting up to 145, my heart rate got up to 160 because I didn't get a full recovery time. Well, that's a microcosm of, of your sleep. If you don't get that full rest interval, you're already, you're already partially on fumes when you get up in the morning. And that's not a good place to be. Yeah, I, um, I didn't realize how terrible my sleep was. That was actually the first thing that we had to attack with neurofeedback because mm -hmm. they were saying like for the last probably 20 years because of my concussions, I was not going into the, the deep sleep. Um, so I wasn't getting rid of all that stuff. It just my delta waves or whatever they were, were just yeah. not getting to where they needed to be. And so that was the very first thing we fixed. And again, I would, I had lived my life thinking, you know, sleep when I'm dead, you know, we, we want to go and do stuff and we want to stay right. active, wanna yeah. active. Um, but now, yeah, now every, I, everyone I talk to, especially with my kids, I'm like, no, this is a, hey, you're growing when you're sleeping. This is productive. It seems like you're not doing anything, but it's productive. Yes. Yeah. And that's the problem. And I, and I talk about it in the book that we, we look at sleep all wrong. We look at it as wasted time mm -hmm. and we've been in, in our drive through you know, rapid news cycle, multitasking lifestyles, it's, oh, that's wasted time. Mm -hmm. That's time that I could be doing other stuff. No, that's not wasted time. That's a very, very important time. That's when you, that's when your gains from the gym really count. That's when the jujitsu, the, the class that you went to and you got home at 830, that's when those moves become a permanent part of your jujitsu repertoire. That's when the biochemistry that you studied that day goes into your memory so that you can use it on the test, you know, and that's why like cramming people that cram the night before a test and they stay up all night, they have all of that information in the, in the Ram, right. They have, they have it in the short term memory mm -hmm. so they can spew it out on that test and maybe pass the test. But guess what? If the, you're in a cumulative course where you're going to have an end of course final, where you got to regurgitate that stuff back again, you just screwed yourself because you didn't get a good night's sleep. You crammed. And now you're not going to remember it. Mm -hmm. um, man, I had something else with sleep, but I forgot. Uh, probably wasn't too important. Now, with how about with exercise? Because this is something I struggle with too. Um, what? Why is it important? What should we be shooting for? And and with all of this, like, I, I think it's really important to try to find something that's manageable, you know, and realistic. Yeah. Because I find myself doing programs and then 10 days into it, I'm like, ah, I can't, I can't do it. I can't keep up with it. So, so what, what are your thoughts on uh, exercise? Yeah. When it, when it comes to exercise, I think a couple of things, no, number one, uh, like you said, it has to be realistic. It has to be something manageable. And I think right out of the gate, everybody needs to, you have to have something that's definable. Uh, and it's, it, it, this was, was really made concrete for me a couple of years ago. I had, a, I had, I, I'm, I absolutely abhor New Year's resolutions, but I had, a, I had a guy on my podcast to talk about New Year's resolutions. Um, and one thing that he brought up is he said, people make the New Year's resolution, I'm going to get more exercise. That means absolutely fucking nothing. I mean, that, that means I'm going to walk to the mailbox, right? It means nothing. And, and, and you can't have these vague erythrial descriptions, you have to have, you know, I'm going to get this many days exercise a week, or I'm going to lose this many pounds, or I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, increase, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to run a marathon, you know, you, you need to have some type of manageable goal, it has to be manageable, it has to be measurable. Um, and then you need to sit down and realistically look at, well, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, I have, you know, I work these days, so, you know, maybe my work week is so crowded, I have to work out both days on the weekend. I have to make time for that. Or maybe I have to have some lunch workouts in there, or some evening workouts in there because I have to work out. So you have to plan that out. Then you start looking at what kind of program you want to do. And, you know, there's a bunch. I've had Mark Ripito on my podcast, who's an icon uh, in, in fitness and strength training. Um, I, I highly respect Mark, and I think his program works amazingly for those who are into that type of stuff, I could never do it, you know? And I told him when he was on my podcast, I said, you know, hey, Mark, you're an expert. 
I said, but I would get, I would get bored and not want to do your program. And he goes, but I don't care if you're bored. And I'm like, I understand that, man. I'm just, but I'm not that guy, you know, I, maybe, you know, say that I don't have enough discipline. I, I'll wear that label. I'm sorry. You know, so you have to pick something that you like and, you know, whether that's CrossFit, jujitsu, yoga, whatever it might be, it, it really needs to be something to capture your interest. If you're somebody that just abhors exercise to begin with and you go in there and it feels like work, you're not going to be able to stay with it. And, you know, when I go to the gym, it doesn't feel like, like work. I mean, I cringe a little bit when I go, oh, you added three, you added three more revolutions to my around the world. You know, oh, what the hell? You know, yeah, because I know it's going to, I know I'm, I'm going to embrace the suck, but I enjoy it when it's going on. I enjoy pushing myself to failure. And so you have to pick something that you enjoy. So, you know, have a plan, have a real plan. It should be a concrete plan. Figure out how much time you have, figure out what your goals are. And then figure out a way to get there that it's something that you're going to enjoy, whether that's P90X, yoga, you know, you know, something out there. And I tell people it's trying to do it on your own. If, if you're completely lost, then get with somebody, you know, hi, hire a coach just for a one time sit down, if nothing else, even if you don't, you know, I'm not going to be a full time trainer and say, look, this is I don't know what I'm doing, you know, generally get me in, in the right direction. You know, and it, and it reaps physical benefits and mental benefits and psychological benefits. And we, and we just, we know that because every study has shown it. Yeah, so true. And I think the same goes for diet. So mm. what would you tell someone, if you had just some key things to tell someone about their diet and improving their overall health, what, what advice would you give them? You know, if, 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 this, if it's an elevator spiel, you know, I just say, you know what, if it's, if it's canned, if it's frozen, if it's, uh, if it's processed and, you know, if it's in a box, you had water, those are not for you. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was walking around two days ago, or it was in the ground two days ago, or it was swimming or flying two days ago, that's for you, right? Mm -hmm. That's healthy food, right? In a nutshell. Um, I always tell people to avoid exclusionary diets. I think they're a little bit more trouble than they're worth. You know, some people do great on them. Hey, good for them. I don't think, I think I, I'm not going to try to argue with millions of years of evolution. I think we're omnivores. Our ancestors were omnivores. Uh, now that doesn't mean industrial farming is a good thing. That, that doesn't mean that yes, we're eating too, probably eating too much red meat in the United States. Absolutely. We are. Um, and that's not an excuse to eat, you know, you know, crap like hamburgers and stuff like that. So you know, uh, making your own food is always a good idea. Uh, and if you can't, if you're just too busy, there's meal prep services and these aren't, they're not TV dinners, you know, meal, meal prep services are totally different. This is fresh food that comes to you refrigerated. Uh, in some cases you have to cook in some places you just, in cases you just have to heat up, but you know, poultry, fish, green leafy vegetables, uh, you know, don't, you know, things like Things like, you know, a lot of bread, a lot of pasta, a lot of cream sauces. You know, I'm not, uh, I eat what I guess what you would call kind of a quasi paleo diet is, is I, I look to the to paleo on a lot of the things that I should eliminate, but I don't go whole hog. I do, I still eat cheese. I still eat nuts, um, you know, legumes, which, you know, in paleo, you're not supposed to, um, because I think they're uh, basically, I, if, if I'm, if I go full paleo, I feel like I'm too restricted on, on proteins and on certain vitamins. Um, and I'm just not ready to make that full commitment. Um, but yeah, just eat, you know, think of the, the, the whole concept behind paleo, which is eating as our ancestors ate is a smart way to go. You know, that's, and it's hard to do in, in our current society and in our current lifestyle. Yeah. I think for me, <laughs> so much of it, one of the things I discovered was, really looking at my relationship with food and how I, how I would think, especially at nighttime, that it is a reward. Like I deserve this. I just, you know, I had a good day. I, I deserve this treat. I'm going to treat myself to this and to that and then to that. And before you know, I'm like, none of that stuff made me feel good. Like it all made me worse off ingesting this. Right. stuff. But at that time, like my brain process was like, well, this is a reward and I deserve it. So this is what I want. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, really trying to break that in, trying to, trying to change my perspective on what food is, you know, that it is nourishment, that it's our fuel. Um, yeah. 
and I got a long ways to go, but having uh, the meal prep service, dude, that's what I use. And I cook for the family and it's, I actually enjoy it. They're healthy meals. And that's probably one of the biggest things I did. Like one of the best positive things I've done. Um, yeah. but it's hard for me to try to figure out like, okay, what's a meal and how do I make one? But if I, all the ingredients are sent in the recipe, I was like, I could do that. So yeah. I enjoy you know, it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, cause I was, you know, just like you talk about, if you flash back to say last November, I, I got into a bad rut, you know, dietary wise during COVID. And, you know, it wasn't uncommon at least once a week for me to make an ice cream run in the evenings. And I'd get home and I'd eat it, you know, and I just wasn't really enjoying it. I didn't feel good about it while mm. I was eating it. And then once I cleaned up my diet and my diet's clean, I've eliminated, you know, a lot of the processed food, definitely a lot of the processed carbs and sugars. Now I have a banana and to me, it takes, tastes better than a dairy cream, dairy queen ice cream cone. Yeah. Like just, you know, just the amount of fructose that's in a banana is like this huge reward. And I can feel my cells just like sucking up those carbs, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm getting way more enjoyment out of that banana than I did out of a sonic blast, you know, five months ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, what is there anything else that you would recommend? Um, one of the things that that I've mentioned in that I go over in my book and that I also struggle with going back to being productive was a uh, meditation and mm -hmm. breath work and how hard it is for me to do those two things, unless I'm mixing it with something else like going in the sauna or, or doing other things. Um, but is there anything else that you think would be uh, beneficial for someone to do just to improve their overall well being? Yeah, I think, I think actually mixing it with something like the sauna or yoga or hot yoga, I think that's highly beneficial for just that reason. Cause it's, you know, again, it's, you know, it's the same argument that we have about sleep, you know, for somebody to sit in the Lotus position and just chill, that can be pretty challenging, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I would imagine, you know, I have seen pictures of your backyard. It's a very tranquil appearing place, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, I'm going to guess if you're just sitting there with your eyes closed, there's traffic going by, there's kids down the block screaming, you know, there's distractions from that, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, you know, unless you turn your phone, you know, you, you get, you can hear a notification buzz on your phone going on. So you really have to separate yourself. So the idea of putting your phone in a, in a, in a little cubby hole and going into a yoga studio or going into a sauna or something like that. Um, and I think you're getting, you know, dual benefit in that case, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, or in some cases more, I mean, cause you're getting the mental aspect of it and the physical aspect of it. And, and, you know, if, if you're the type of person that believes in that thing, a spiritual aspect of it as well, you're getting all of those things together. But I do think, you know, some, some shutdown time during the day, especially for people with PTSD and CTE to quiet their mind and listen to other parts of their brain that they've been letting get overridden by the loud parts of their brain at other times. The trick is, is doing it. You know, the, it's, it's different. And you've done stuff with, you know, neurofeedback and biofeedback. So, Sometimes the, the, the pathway to get you there is a little bit complicated to navigate, but it, it is highly beneficial, you know, for, for people when they can do it. And you know what I tell people, I'm like, you know, what? well, can you just do, what if you could just sit and listen to music mm -hmm. as kind of a bridge to get you there? Um, and, and a lot of times people can do that because it's almost, it's, it's like, it's a little bit more pleasant than white noise. And it can also, to, to me, uh, music and smell are probably the two biggest triggers of memory with me. So, and, and you're, you're talking about being really close to the hippocampus, you know, when, when you're doing stuff like that. So you're, so you're lighting up parts of the brain where a lot of these people are having these, these issues, right? You know, the, the thalamic nuclei uh, and it, you, you get those parts of the brain lit up and, you know, I'm always amazed that, you know, I'll be listening to a song and I don't even know what memory it's evoking in because at some point in my life, maybe that music was playing and something happened to me, you know, or just something in the lyrics cued a memory in me that I can't even quite identify, but all of a sudden I have an emotional response to it. So, you know, for, for people that say like, you know, I've tried medicine, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. I, you know, I'm going to be put on some of your fit, you know, favorite, you know, and hey, I love thrash metal as much as anybody, but I would, 
I would encourage you to get away from that. <laughs> Something a little bit more mellow. Um, and just sit and listen to it. You know, put some put some headphones on, lay down comfortably, you know, at, at an incline and 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 just let that music flow through you and see what it evokes from you. That's a, that's an excellent uh, suggestion because I do know so many people that just cannot cannot do that. They do not want to be alone with their thoughts. Um, yeah. But I think yeah, having that music that's a super great suggestion. M music can be a, a, a almost a form of guided med meditation mm -hmm. that it's not even purposeful. I mean, it's going to get you there. The music doesn't know what it's doing, and you don't know what it's going to do for you, but it's going to happen. You know that's and that's. You know, for me, because I'm a child of the 80s, so I'll put on 80s music or uh, the Beatles were always playing when I was growing up in my house. So, you know, I'll, I'll put on, you know, the Beatles complete. And every song, there, there's something in that that, you know, that I feel like I have an emotional attachment to this song and I don't even know why. That's awesome. Um, now, with uh, Greybeard, <coughs> Greybeard Performance, um, so I haven't got my rash guard yet. I want, I can't wait. I to know, go. I know. I, I just started <laughs> training again. I was like, okay, I can actually wear it now. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Um, I'm going to be taking your supplements. So what, what are your supplements? Why, why did you start Graybeard, And what are you, uh, what are you giving people? Yeah. So a uh, great question. So I, I noticed I was getting, I kept getting the same emails, which is, Hey doc, you know, what, you know, uh, what supplements do you take? What should I be taking? And there's a lot of great companies out there. And, you know, uh, I tried a lot of their stuff. But, but then when I would look at the ingredients, I would either see, you know, yeah, that's, I see some things in here that I know are beneficial because I've looked at the science behind them and some things in here that are not beneficial. Or I'd see things like, yeah, that's beneficial, but not for me. Like, that's not that's not what I'm what I'm looking for. And th this was kind of a long time coming because I, you know, I was always looking out for should I be taking supplements or not, and that that started way back, probably in my late 30s. Mm -hmm. And I, I turned to a lot of people on that, and and it's mixed. Like I know I know a physician who I who I highly respect, who will tell you, you should never. This his exact words: there are two types of vitamins out there: those that do absolutely nothing and those that cause cancer. Like like you just shouldn't take them at all. And then I, I know other physicians that are like, no, this is, I have this regimen that I take uh, and this is what you should be taking. So I took a little bit from everybody because I value everybody's opinion. And then in the end, I just started doing a deep dive, doing a literature search. And I, and I did it supplement by supplement as a supplement would come up that I was interested in, you know, does this really do what it says it does? I would do a deep dive into the research and I would look, okay, it was this a properly conducted study. Was it conclusive or not? Okay. All right. That's something that, I, that I'm willing to try because the, the evidence is out there. I would try it. Hey, it works. Boom. I'm going to put that in my permanent rotation. And I was piecemealing it because, you know, these, these weren't coming in formulations that, that I could just get. So I, I kind of, I had to line all the bottles up myself and remember to take so many of these, so many of these, so many of those, and so many of that. And I was getting these emails, as I said, all the time, doc, what are you taking? And I, and I would give this huge rundown. And I realized, you know what? I just need to be making these myself because I'm telling them what a pain in the ass it is for me to go get it. And I, I want my life to be easier. I want their life to be easier so I can go just buy this. So I'm going to do that. So I looked online and I just Googled how to make your own supplements. And uh, through trial and error, uh, I, I found, I narrowed it down to a couple of different companies. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to have a contact here in Austin uh, that works for a supplement company. I asked him his opinion on the two companies I narrowed it down to. He steered me in the right direction. He said, this place is, is highly reputable, clean facility. They're totally above board in everything they do. So I ended up going with, with a company called NutriCaps and uh, they make my supplements. And I've got a plan for probably seven different supplements. The primary question that I was getting had to do with recovery uh, pain relief and just kind of healing. You know, I feel beat up every, every night. I feel beat up. I wake up after jujitsu. I feel beat up. I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm healing property properly. What do I need to do for that? So that's where longevity formula came from, which was my, is my primary. That's uh, it's in the supplement world, they call it your hero skew, right? The one that you say, this, this is everything. Everything's going to rotate around this. 
And uh, longevity formula is all about tissue repair, uh, immune boosting, healing, anti-inflammation because we're because of what we do and also because of our lifestyle because it, we are just our western diet you are always ingesting pro-inflammatories it just works that way mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to counter that so that's that's why there's some some natural anti-inflammatories uh natural energy analgesic pain remove pain relievers uh the vitamins that you need uh and the trace minerals that you need for all that tissue repair, because it does get more difficult as we get older. And that's, that's where longevity formula came from. And then the second most common question was, how do you do it? You know, I finish a, a day at work and I want to go to class and I just don't have the energy to do it. I tried drinking a insert name of crazy looking energy drink here. Uh, I felt like my heart was going to beat out of my chest. What do I do? And that's where I came up with energy formula. And I, again, I looked at the science. I like, like what's out there that works. It's not going to give you r bad side effects in a crash. And it basically boiled down to B vitamins uh, and a couple of amino acids uh, and naturally sourced caffeine. Caffeine is really underrated. You know, caffeine and nicotine are probably the two most abused drugs, you know, legal drugs uh, in the world. Uh, nicotine, probably no redeeming qualities whatsoever. You know, even though I, I smoke a cigar, probably you know, two to four times a month. Uh, caffeine, however, when used properly in the proper amounts and not abused is, is massively beneficial. And, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of elite fitness guys, you know, they'll say, you know, that's one of the most underappreciated things you can do for your body is caffeine. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, South American yerba mate. I was introduced to it when I was in special forces. Um, and uh, that's where I sourced my, my caffeine rather than just throw caffeine in a pill. Uh, I have yerba mate in there. And uh, I, I find that, you know, the, the combination of what I put in there uh, works really well. It's, it's like a pre-workout without being a pre-workout. That's awesome. Um, where can people find out more about Greybeard Performance and uh, your podcast? So uh, Greybeard Performance, you go to graybeardperformance.com uh, uh, or you can follow me on Instagram at Greybeard Performance. Uh, the podcast is Mind of the Warrior. I'm on, I think I'm on pretty much every platform. I don't know if there's a platform that I'm not on. Mm -hmm. um, and that you can just, you know, look for whatever, whatever platform you're using, whether it's Spotify, Apple, uh, whatever other crazy Android name or whatever, just, uh, just search for Mind of the Warrior or, ser or search for Dr. Mike Simpson uh, and it should come up. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for reading the synopsis. Thank you for sharing your book with me. Um, and when is that book coming out? Is that your scheduled for September, October? Scheduled for September. So if uh, God willing and the river don't rise and uh, the editors don't tear it up too bad, should be a September launch date. Awesome. And that's a incredible book. I'm um, glad you wrote it. it. Definitely helped me already. So thank you again for everything. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have an awesome day. Thank you, brother. You too. Thanks for having me on. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Now it is time for a story. This one is from 25 Perfect Days plus five more. This short story is 30 Day Program. Hope you enjoy and talk to you next week. Later. Thirty Day Program, March 23rd, 2048. The bell rang and Gabe got up from his desk. He pretended to look for something in his bag, waited until everyone had left the room. He threw two pills in his mouth, swallowed them dry. Gabe's locker was ten feet from the door, but in the wrong direction. Only left turns when leaving classrooms, another stupid rule. It took him almost two minutes to circle back around each time. He took the left and someone kicked the bottom of Gabe's shoe. Fucking Frankie. Been doing this shit since they were five. Through his nasally laugh, Frankie said, Hold up, man. Gabe kept going, made a right at the first hallway. Frankie popped up beside him. Gotta hit your locker? No, I'm just taking a tour, dumbass. You don't have to be a dick. Gabe switched his focus to Derek, the new kid, his blonde hair bouncing off his shoulders. A couple of days ago, they got partnered up in chemistry.
Derek wasn't like most of the others transferred here. He didn't seem to care if he fit in or not. Hardly spoke at all until this morning. Derek had asked Gabe if he shot hoops. Gabe thought it might be some new drug, but Derek was just talking about basketball. At the end of class, Gabe agreed to play him one-on-one -on -one after school. A line of students filed through the archway toward everyone waiting for transport. But Derek swerved right, snuck through the fence. Not asking permission to opt out of transport was cause for expulsion. But Derek walked like a man without a care. Gabe turned the corner and Frankie asked, So, would you do it? Gabe moved onto the walkway closest to the window, split his attention between the dumpy girl in front of him and the idiots attached to the screens, oblivious to everyone around them. No one more oblivious than Bryce, standing there, drool glistening in the corner of his mouth. A different dude after the program. Frankie repeated, Would you? Huh? Get connected. That's just for the controllers. Didn't you hear anything Taurus said? This summer it's open to anyone. Gabe had been daydreaming in class, thinking about what Derek had said in chemistry the first day they'd been paired up that he recognized him. Dave had never seen him before last month when Derek transferred. I could never afford it, Gabe said, but if you could? They made their final right, stopped at Gabe's locker, ten feet from where he'd started. Gabe pressed his thumb to the lock to open it. He said, Already too connected as it is. Well, I'm definitely asking my uncle. Frankie's uncle raked in the big bucks as an anchorman. But Frankie never saw a dime. His parents were in the same position at Gabe's. You need to lighten up, Frankie said. He dug in his back pocket and pulled out a pink envelope. Trisha asked me to give this to you. Gabe looked past the note at Rocky's locker. It had been over three months since they put him in the program. No one had heard a thing. No one was asking. Here, man, Frankie said. Gabe grabbed the card. Gabriel? And cursing flowing across it, he shoved the envelope in his bag, merged back into the herd. Well, what should I tell her? I don't know. She digs you, man. You can't keep ignoring her. They headed for the archway. Landon, a chunky senior training to become a true resident for peace, stood near the loading area in his silver sash, scrutinizing everyone. Man, I'm telling you, Frankie said. If Triss even looked at me... Like that, we'd have fifty fucking babies by now. You're a moron. Gabe didn't just mean about girls. Just like all their classmates, Frankie believed the lies his uncle spread on the news. Gabe didn't. His dad had explained how everything worked the last time they'd gone hiking. Left her electronics behind. His dad had stood up to the reverend and turned his back on the way. Lived to whisper about it. They hadn't talked about it since Gabe got chipped for school, but Gabe remembered every word. Through the six-inch slit in the wall, Gabe saw a couple of kids out on the sidewalk. Only those that lived within three blocks were given free passes to be on foot. Then there was Derek, across the street slipping through the trees. Gabe said, You know what? I'm not taking TP today. I'll see you in the morning. Frankie chuckled. He's serious? We have to take it. They only lived five blocks from campus, but transport was the rule unless they personally opted out. The glorified hall monitors rarely granted passes. The way got paid for each body on board. Yeah, I'm just going to walk. Dude, Frankie said. That's not a good idea. Gabe didn't care. He told Frankie, I'll be fine. Frankie shook his head continued down the fenced walkway, joined the students standing four across waiting for transport. Gabe straightened his back the way his dad used to, tough and strong, not a scared little coward, and headed straight for Landon, checking off names on his electronic clipboard. Gabe ignored the recog glasses, focused on the acne covering the senior's face. Gabe held out his wrist. I'm mounting out a TP. Landon pushed his chest so it almost matched his belly. You have a note from your mommy? 
There was no chance of lying with Landon wearing the glasses, so Gabe recited page 53 of the school manual. Students can be granted permission if they are 15 years of age and request to opt out. Landon studied Gabe's face, the recog glasses checking his vitals. Gabe slowed his breath until Landon scanned his wrist. Don't get bleached, weirdo. Landon wasn't a true resident for peace or a controller, but he was the kind of guy who tricked Gabe down the moment he came one. With no reason to upset Landon anymore, Gabe asked, May I go? Landon flicked him in the head and Gabe bit his tongue, walked off. The sun was brilliant. Gabe cut through the trees, stopped for a second, heard the slap of the basketball on cement. Derek was directly across the street, bouncing the ball, his button-down shirt off, now tucked in his back pocket, tight white tank top hugging his chest. At six feet, with all those muscles, he had to be close to the cutoff weight. Derek kept bouncing the ball. There he is. I knew you'd follow me. You ready to get your ass handed to you? Gabe acted like it was no big deal. Not today. He lunged to steal the ball. Derek spun and laughed when Gabe slammed into his back. In those moves, this is going to be get ugly. Yeah, we'll see. I told you. It's been a long time since I played. Oh, I believe you. Derek dribbled the ball a foot in front of Gabe. You ready? I have to stop by my house first to check in. A giant silver and black transport rumbled down the street. The sidewalks were practically empty. There were no signs of the local gangs, no threat of having bleach thrown on his face. Plus, I need to change. Lead the way, Derek said. Nah, I'm all right. Derek followed anyway. You better not be thinking of chickening out. Walking with Derek behind him let Gabe breathe a little easier. He hadn't been out on the streets by himself since his uncle Julio's accident left the man in a wheelchair. Derek bounced the basketball off Gabe, went back to dribbling. You've never opted out, have you? Gabe shook his head, counted the houses that had been torn down. The others with Reverend's real estate sold signs marking their destruction. Gabe's dad had explained how all the empty lots were the work of the controllers. They paid beyond top dollars so the way made an easy profit. Derek stepped into the street so they were side by side. Love what they've done with the neighborhood. Gabe turned to him. Thought you just moved here. Derek shook his head, his fine blonde hair brushing his shoulders. Grandparents, Mom and Dad used to bring me down every Sunday. Now it's just me and my Graham. She's happy to have company. Gabe didn't ask what happened to Derek's parents. Wasn't in the mood to hear a story like his Aunt Maria's. But he finally understood why Derek said he recognized him. The next block down, they came to where the library had been before the controllers converted it into a parking lot for their heavy equipment. Gabe's house was just around the corner. He said, Hey man, you mind waiting here? Derek took a whiff of his armpit. Come on, I want to meet your mom. Older women love me. Very funny. No, she's already going to freak over the whole transport deal. Whatever. But if she doesn't want to let you out, just tell her I'll protect you. Derek flexed his bicep. Gabe shoved him. Derek didn't budge. Go for it. Derek dropped the ball, stopped at his foot. Punch for punch, chest or gut. Yeah, right. I'll even let you go first. Come on. A single bead of sweat dripped down his neck, soaked into the tank top. You can ask it, Derek said. I know you want to. Gabe looked around to see if anyone was within a hearing range, where the closest camera could be. I gotta go. I know everyone's talking about the rumor. What happened at my old school? Don't tell me you haven't heard it. Gabe softly said, You really do that to him? He called me a faggot, so I was justified. The judge didn't even trip, said I did the right thing. Gabe was glad Derek skipped the details. He didn't want to know if those things were true. Look, I really have to go. You're coming back, right? Yeah, but it might be a few minutes. Derek dribbled the ball between his legs. I'll be waiting. Gabe headed up to his porch, looked over the top of his house. The skies, usually gray, had gotten worse since the blocks sprouted up. Gabe's mom was already at the door, her hair pulled back into a ponytail. 
She wasn't more than five feet two, but you could hear that voice a half mile away. What in the hell are you doing? She said. You scared me to death. Relax, Mom. Gabe patted her shoulder when he entered the house. I wanted to walk. I called you five minutes since I got the message from the transport. You pick up when I called. Do you hear me? Gabe kept walking, heading toward his room. My screen was off because of class. I didn't turn it back on. Hey, I'm talking to you. At his bedroom entrance, Gabe stopped, turned to face her. Mom, five calls in five minutes, really? Think you might be overreacting? No, I don't. Gabe went into his room, threw his bag on his bed, slipped off his shirt. It's fine, Mom, not a big deal. I'm going to play basketball, just wanted to warm up with the walk. With who, a boy? Gabe heard the fear in her voice, but didn't look at her. He put on his Vex stretched t-shirt. It sucked in the small ring of fat around his waist. He said, it's just a guy from school. Well, who is it? You know our rule. Gabe unbuckled his pants. Don't mind. She turned away but didn't leave. So who is it? Gabe shook off his pants, took the pink cart out of his envelope, and placed it on his dresser next to a black plastic bag of magazines. He pulled on his shorts and said, A friend. Derek. He just transferred. She was looking right at him. You're not going anywhere until we meet him. The sun's going down in two hours. We're just going to play a few games of 21. Gabe snatched the plastic bag, threw it and the girly magazines into the trash. Don't be like that. I know it can be embarrassing to buy those. Nothing to be ashamed about. He pushed past her. I don't need them. His mom shushed him, followed him into the living room, and nodded at the wall screen. She kept her back to it and mouthed, Don't even joke. Gabe smiled and said, I'll be back before dark. He hated the screen, but it served a purpose. All she did was sit in front of it and watch the news while someone watched her. I didn't say you could go. I want to meet this boy. He headed for the door. Maybe after the game. Did you take your pills? Of course, Mom. Now I have to go. You're already on your second warning. Next time, I know. Stop, okay? I'll be back. One more violation meant the program. Gabe didn't need to be reminded of what that meant. He'd been hearing stories since he was a little boy. Derek was waiting at the corner. He stopped dribbling, took a crumpled black mask from the back pocket, and slipped it over his mouth. You got one? Gabe searched the light post for a camera. You can't hide your face. Dude, relax. We're not protesting anything. I'm protecting my lungs, and we're just going to play a game. Gabe wasn't so sure that was true. I don't have one. Derek reached back into his pocket, pulled out another mask. He tossed it over. The mask was just as crumpled as the other one, but this was a grayish white. Gabe said, You've been sitting on it all day? Derek started down the street and called over his shoulder. Yep. Gabe slipped it on, smelled cheap cologne and something sour. It was weirdly intoxicating. Derek slowed down so they were back side by side, a slow dribble that blended in with each step. So your mom trip on you? You seem kind of pissed. Gabe bit the inside of his cheek, then lunged for the ball. Derek crossed it over to his other hand. Derek said, You guys losing the house? Not yet. It's not in foreclosure. I hear them talk all the time, though. How they're behind and how much they've been offered. But my dad won't take it, says it's not enough. Derek said, What about heading for the hills, working for one of the families? My dad would never move into the block. He'd die first. Derek turned down a dark road. Gabe hadn't been on it very long time. I thought we were headed to the wreck zone. That place is crawling with controllers. Harlow Park was just down the hill. It had fallen into disrepair. Thick brush crept onto the paths. Dying branches hung over the rusty playground. Strands of ivy covered the fences around the courts turning them into secluded caves. A few men hung around the baseball dugout, another two by the bathrooms. 
Gabe thought about bleach attacks. He asked about criminals. Stop worrying. I told you I'll protect you. We shouldn't be down here. The men were all fit, muscles showing under tight shirts, but no one seemed to be here for sports. Derek opened a small gate and slipped onto the basketball court. The sun filtered through the ivy. It was private, but not as dark as Gabe had imagined. The sky was still bright and gray above. We try to keep it clean, Derek said. Gabe noticed a condom wrapper in the corner. Full quarter half, Derek asked and took off his shirt. We only have until dark. That only gives me an hour or so to kick your ass. Derek chucked the ball. The sharp sting of it slapped against Gabe's palms. Derek's bright blue eyes pierced through him. He crouched down defensively. Gabe dribbled, angled his body to block Derek from the ball. He tried to move right. Derek cut him off, forced him left. Gabe's weakest hand. Derek whispered, Come on, faggot. The words seared through Gabe's mind. He dribbled faster. You can't beat me, faggot. Shut up. Why, faggot? All it took was a rumor to get you put into the program, and Gabe already had two warnings. Anyone could be listening. Undercover cops, controller camp kids, snitches sent in as lures. Maybe that's what Derek was. Gabe glanced up, expected to see a closed-circuit camera in the sky or hidden in the ivy. Derek whispered again, Faggot. Gabe picked up his dribble. Derek smacked the ball out of his hands, pinned Gabe against the fence, slowly pulled down Gabe's mask. Derek said, What about me? You think I'm a faggot? Gabe wanted to run or throw a punch. Why weren't his pills kicking in? Derek's face was so close to his. Gabe's voice trembled when he said, Please. Derek took off his own mask, leaned in, the cologne and sweat so strong, their lips pressed. Gabe closed his eyes, all the dreams, the fantasies he'd blocked out coming true. He opened his mouth, kissed back, rough but gentle and frightened. A man shouted, Shit! Controllers! Gabe pulled away, his lips still burning. Derek peered through the ivy. Oh no! Gabe rushed next to him. Four patrol cars, two men being tackled next to the bathrooms. A young controller stepped onto the court. He had a perfectly plastered part in his blonde hair, his jaw clenching like he'd been waiting all morning to crack someone's skull. Well, what the fuck do we have here? Derek stepped in front of Gabe. We're just playing basketball. Yeah, right. The controller ignored his electro prod went straight for his plasma baton, the blue pulsing current flowing up and down the wand. Derek threw up his hands. Hey man, we don't want any trouble. We're just playing a game. The controller's fingers tightened around the handle. Derek clenched his fists. Gabe knew what was going to happen, but he couldn't move, couldn't reach out to pull him back. Derek lowered the shoulder and charged at the controller, who raised the plasma baton. Derek beat the blow and tackled the controller. They rolled over and over until Gabe heard the crackling of burning flesh. The controller's scream. Derek pressed the blue pulse to the man's neck. Gabe closed his eyes, the sizzle echoing in his ears. Go! Derek said to Gabe. Gabe couldn't look away from the gaping black ditch in the controller's throat. Oh, what did you do? You have to go! Gabe saw the open gate, another squad car pulling up. He still couldn't move. Derek ran over, shoved the mask back onto Gabe's face. You don't have a choice. You won't survive the program. Gabe stood frozen, kept whispering. No. Derek grabbed him by the arm, yanked him towards the gate, shoved him onto the path. Another controller was barreling down the hill. Derek squeezed the plasma baton. Go! he screamed, then ran for the controller. Gabe watched for a second, turned, then angled away from a screaming man with two controllers kicking him in the gut and face. There was nothing between Gabe and the trees. His face was hidden. There was nothing left to do but run. This 
This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.